You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So this week we have Remembrance Day. Uh, We're going to sing O Canada after the blessing, after the service together. Uh, So this week we're going to be thinking about Canadian freedom and what a precious thing it is, how blessed we are to have the freedoms that we have, the sacrifice that was made for our freedoms. We are free to worship. That's why we're here. We can vote for our elected officials without fear from our government. We have freedom of speech and other great things in this land because of those freedoms. This morning I want to talk about Christian freedom and the principles that guide our Christian freedom. So we've been looking uh, at Galatians. The backdrop to the letter is that there's these false teachers that are are saying that the Galatians, the Gentile Galatians, must follow the law of Moses. Uh, They are uh, not free from it, but are bound to it. They must be circumcised, follow the food laws, follow the calendar, all of those things. Uh, But the law was given for a time, and it was given for Israel. But with the coming of Jesus, that time was over. And so they were free from the Old Testament law, says the Apostle Paul. Uh, One of the troubles with this, or potential trouble with it, is uh, when we say people have freedom, sometimes people think that's freedom to do whatever we want. Um, I've heard Christians say this. We're not under the law, so there's no rules. We're not under law. And so they're opposed to any kind of rule or standard. But this is not what Christian freedom is about or what Paul is talking about. Uh, Christian freedom, uh, there's still right and wrong. There are still standards. Jesus is our Lord. He has commands that we're supposed to live by. There's still standards. And so this morning, I want to talk about um, our Christian freedom. Now, did the Galatian churches have a problem uh, of misusing their Christian freedom? Were they indulging in whatever they liked? Or is Paul just completing his teaching? He said, you're free from the law. And now is he just sort of saying, I guess, wrapping it up and saying, how do we use this freedom? I can imagine both, a little bit of both. I can also imagine that the false teachers that, that are saying the Gentile Christians have to follow the law are, are, uh, have some objections, and Paul might be answering those too. Whatever the case, whatever the case, Paul is giving instruction on how we are to use our Christian freedom. If we're free from the Old Testament law, then how do we live? 
What are the boundaries? What does right living look like? And Paul, in our passage, he gives us three major guidelines. Uh, He says, don't indulge in the flesh. He says, serve one another in love. And he says, walk by the Spirit. So that's what we're going to look at. So the Christians and their freedom are not to indulge in the flesh. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. What does Paul mean by indulging in the flesh? And this is an important question, and I'm going to take some time on it. The term flesh in the, in the New Testament means many things, several things, and often Christians understand it uh, the wrong way in the wrong places. So I'm going to talk about the different meanings in the different places. And first, at its most basic, flesh can mean the material stuff that hangs on our bones, the soft stuff. Uh, this is for humans and animals. Uh, Jesus says in Luke 24, 39, he says, Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Uh, This is Jesus after he's risen from the dead. He's saying, touch my flesh. Touch my flesh. And he's separating it from his bones. We were made flesh and bones. He says, touch and see. A second flesh can be a reference to the whole of our physical bodies. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul says this, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. And here they're translating the word flesh as body because that's the contrast is between our material self and our spirit. Uh, flesh can mean everything that makes us human. Uh, the, the totality of our humanity, uh, human body and spirit, or body and soul. In John 1.14, Jesus, or it says of Jesus, John says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This is Jesus telling us that, that the Son of God, the word, who was with God at the beginning, at a certain point became fully human. He became flesh. Uh, flesh not meaning just the soft stuff, but everything about us that makes us human, our whole humanity. It wasn't that Jesus was uh, God, you know, wearing a costume of flesh. No, no, he became human in every way, the whole shot. Uh, Flesh can mean the people who are our blood relations. Uh, Romans 9.3, Paul says this, For I, I could wish that I myself were accursed, and cut off for Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. <clears throat> so is, is, he's talking about his Jewish brothers and sisters. And, and we speak similarly. We, we talk about people who are our flesh and blood, our relations, our flesh. And, what, and now what needs to be pointed about all these definitions that I've given you of, of the way the word flesh is used in the New Testament is These are all good. There's nothing bad about any of these things. God made us. After he made humanity, he made the world in humanity, he said it's very good. Flesh is good in its essence. Uh, The material universe is good. There's nothing negative in these senses of the use of the term flesh. And this is important because some people think that our, our human flesh, some Christians get the idea that our human flesh is actually a bad thing and only a bad thing. But that's not the case. Christianity is very affirming of the flesh. Uh, the Reformation was, uh, in a thousand years, after a thousand years, the Reformation affirmed uh, the book of the Bible, Song of Songs, a book about sexual intimacy as literal and good. Uh, before then, the church sort of said it's an allegory. It's not, it's not about a man and a woman. Because uh, the understanding was flesh is bad. That was their only understanding. But flesh is good. However, however, when sin entered the world through our first parents, our humanity was corrupted by that sin. And we are corrupted by that sin. Uh, We were good, but then we were corrupted. And this is what Paul is talking about when he says, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. He's talking about the corrupt aspect of, of our humanity. And it's not something that just touches our flesh. 
it touches every part of our humanity. Uh, in some degree, uh, Peter similarly says uh, in 2 Peter 2.10, he speaks of the corrupt desires of the flesh. So Peter speaks similarly as Paul. Our humanity has been corrupted so that it has its own corrupt desires. Um, but it's, it's more than just our flesh. You hear what Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. He says, I read this earlier. He says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, or flesh and spirit. We are corrupted uh, uh, through and through. Our material parts of us and our immaterial parts of us. Every aspect of our humanity is tainted. It doesn't mean we're only evil, but our good has been tainted. And this is how Paul is using the word flesh in this in this uh, portion of scripture and i think he uses the word flesh because there's a contrast to god uh, in the sense that god is not flesh and we are flesh that's sort of a contrast and also god is not corrupt and we are corrupt Uh, so i think that's why he chooses the word flesh to represent our fallen humanity Uh, there's a there's a word that we use when we when we pick a single aspect of something to represent the whole. It's called metonymy. Anyway, that's what Paul is doing. He's, he's taking the word flesh and he, he's representing our, our sinful nature. That's how the older NIV translates these passages with the word sinful nature. Uh, the other reason I think he uses the word flesh is because the acts of the flesh, he says in ver- verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. You know, It's hard to see our sinfulness apart from the things that we actually do. We, we sin in thought, um, and, and where we go with our mind, we can sin, uh, but sin is most visible in the things we do in the flesh. Anyway, those are some of my theories about why he chooses that word. Paul, in the, verse 13, he says, we're, he says, we're free from the Old Testament law, but that freedom is not so that we can entertain, give way, or indulge our flesh, our corrupt flesh, our corrupt humanity. That's not the point of Christian freedom. Your sins are paid for. Go and sin freely. No, that's not what Jesus said. Go, go and sin no more. Uh, Paul says we must use our freedom, our Christian freedom, in another way. And this brings us to our second guideline. The first one is don't indulge the flesh. The second one is this. Use your freedom to serve one another. The last part of verse 13. Rather serve one another humbly in love. And there's two words or ideas that should stand out. Uh, The first is serving or serving humbly. And the second is is love. Uh, On on the first reading, you might not catch this, but serving is the language of slavery. That's that's what slaves did. They served their masters. Uh, And and it's, it's quite the contrast when you hear it again. Paul is saying, use your freedom... To serve one another. Use your freedom to be slaves to one another. It's quite the contrast in language. Freedom versus slavery. Christian freedom is the freedom to serve one another. And this is done in love, by means of love. Love is the source of the service. Our freedom enables us to love as we ought and to serve So we've been set free. We've been set free from this legislation that was just meant for Israel. We've been set free from the power of uh, sin. We've been set free from our guilt before God. We're justified. We're not guilty. Use this freedom humbly to serve one another. Paul goes on in verse 14. He says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. This comes from Leviticus. Jesus also said it. Well, on the one hand, Paul is arguing for freedom from the law. The law wasn't evil. Not every part of the law is obsolete. Uh, 
the fulfillment of the law is in love. And that's what we ought to do. Verse 15, Paul warns against fighting, which is the opposite of love. He says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Was there nasty fighting going on in the Galatian churches? I imagine that there was as, as they debated this, do we have to follow the law or not follow the law? I imagine some ugliness. And Paul is saying, this is not the way. This is not how we use our Christian freedom. <clears throat> now, I don't want to suggest that Canada is a superior nation to our friends to the south. We have our own serious issues, I think. But we've been watching, biting and devouring. I think you would agree. Biting and devouring. They're, they're, we're, we're going, they're, tearing, they're tearing each other apart down there. Uh, Christian freedom doesn't allow us to behave like that. Uh, it doesn't allow us to behave like that. <clears throat> Verse 16. <clears throat> Verse 16. And Paul introduces a third guideline, which is really the, the means to accomplish the first two. Don't indulge in the flesh. Serve and love your neighbor. He says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul is speaking figuratively here. He's not talking about physically walking. He is talking about our conduct and behavior. Walking was a Jewish way of speaking. Uh, uh, How someone lived. It was how they walked. Um. In chapter 3 and 4 of Galatians, Paul was telling the Galatian believers that uh, the great evidence uh, that God had accepted them and that they were children's God was the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That was the great evidence, the presence and power of the Spirit already living in them. He's saying, you don't need the law, you have the Spirit. Now Paul says, walk by that Spirit. They already were. Paul is encouraging them again. Walk by that Spirit, meaning that they were to actively and intentionally conduct themselves according to the direction of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. This is, this is essential for Christian living. Uh, and this is how we keep from gratifying the desires of the flesh. It needs to be emphasized that this is not a passive thing. Walking by the Spirit isn't something the Spirit does for us. We have this thing called Christian freedom. We have been set free. We are meant to use that freedom to actively, intentionally walk by the Spirit. It's not good enough just to say, I'm a Christian now. No, if we're Christians and we have the Spirit, we have freedom. We use the freedom to walk by the Spirit. There's a choice. If we're not being active, if we're just passive, waiting for God to do something in our life, we're probably not making great progress in this thing called denying the flesh or in loving service uh, to others. And we're wasting our Christian freedom. The last important thing I want to say about Christian freedom. Paul says that if we walk by the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Where he says you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, he's not giving another command. He's saying this is the result. If you walk by the Spirit, then gratifying the flesh won't happen. Uh, uh, gratifying the desires of the flesh and walking by the Spirit, they're two opposite things and you can't do them at the same time. So if we're active in, 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 in conducting ourselves under the direction and power of the Spirit, the, 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 we won't be gratifying our sinful desires and will, I would say, be enabled to love and serve one another. And this is important. Too many Christians think that Christian freedom 
is freedom from our sinful desires. And that's not true. Christian freedom enables us to walk by the Spirit so that we don't gratify those desires. It doesn't erase them. We are still corrupt human beings. We've been justified. We've been saved. We're still corrupt. The desires have not gone away. And, and, and Christians uh, beat themselves up. For, how come I still th- want wrong things? It's because we're still, we're still in the flesh. We're still in our fallenness, though the Spirit lives in us. But we have this new freedom. We can now deny the desires in us. So we walk by the Spirit. So I say this, don't beat yourself up for your evil desires. I've got them, you've got them. Don't beat yourself up for those things. Don't use, uh, and don't use your Christian freedom to indulge in them either. Use your freedom to deny them. Use your freedom to walk by the Spirit. Use your freedom to love and serve one another.